welcome everyone. My name is Ben Sears. I am a sometime contributor to the People's World. I am the former editor of Political Affairs. I'm also a retired history teacher, which may be an additional reason why we are thrilled and delighted to welcome Dr. Gerald Horn tonight to our webinar. Uh, Dr. Horn is the author of over 30 books, many articles which have had the effect of filling in gaps and shedding light in places in our country's collective memory that needed to be to be uncovered and so on. And uh, the book we are going to talk about tonight is certainly a great example of his of his work. I'll, I'm going to hold a copy up, right? I don't want to take too much time with this, but here is the cover of our uh, the book we are going to discuss tonight. It is called Black Revolutionary, William Patterson, and the Globalization of the African American Freedom Struggle. Let me say quickly, when I read this book, it changed the way I looked at the civil rights movement. I had to look at it in a more global perspective. The whole thing was an experience for me, and that's why I'm so happy that we're doing this tonight. So let's get started. Gerald, Dr. Horn, welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Who was William Patterson? Oh. And what should we know about him? Why is it important for us to know about him in 2017? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be amongst so many thought leaders, comrades, friends, communists, etc. William L. Patterson was a Communist Party member and leader for a period stretching from the 1920s up until his death in 1980. He was born in San Francisco about 10 years before the turn of the 20th century and grew up in the Bay Area where he attended the University of California and also the University of California Law School. He, like many black people of that era, was affected by the system then obtaining in this country known as Jim Crow. You may recall that this was a system of legalized racism, a system that was a close cousin to apartheid in South Africa, a system that was designed not only to humiliate black people and force them into a status of being a cheap labor source, but was also designed in no small measure to split the entire working class. Bill Patterson, needless to say, hated and despised this system. And what's striking is that after World War I, which you may recall stretched from 1914 to 1918, he was about to leave the country and go into permanent exile, like so many black Americans have done before and since. But upon reaching London, he had an encounter that convinced him that he should return to the United States. And serendipitously, this was at the same time as the eruption of the Bolshevik Revolution, whose 100th anniversary, as you know, we're marking this year. The Russian Revolution, as it is called, uh, marked a radical departure in terms of human history. Among other things, it led to the establishment of the U.S. Communist Party, which was a direct outgrowth in many ways of the Bolshevik Revolution. But for our purposes here, I think that it's important to place the Bolshevik Revolution alongside the subtitle to this book, The Globalization of the African-American Freedom Struggle. 
what that subtitle was meant to suggest is that stretching back to the 1600s up until today, a primary and significant force in helping to propel the freedom struggle has been international currents. Uh, you may recall that Frederick Douglass, the great 19th century abolitionist leader, spent considerable time in London in the middle of the 19th century when Britain was considered to be a sworn foe of U.S. ruling classes. Ida B. Wells Barnett, the great journalist and anti-lynching heroine, also spent time in London. This is at the latter part of the 19th century when London still was at, at some ways at sword's point with U.S. ruling classes, rallying opposition to this hated system of lynching. What I argue in this book is that the establishment of the Communist Party and the advent of the Bolshevik Revolution marked just another stage in the globalization of the African American freedom struggle but in many ways, it was the most significant aspect of this globalization struggle that it stretched back hundreds of years because with the Bolshevik Revolution, as I shall explain shortly, the African-American freedom struggle was able to marshal the international community against Jim Crow, just like in the 1970s and 1980s, anti-apartheid forces were able to mobilize an international community against the close cousin of Jim Crow, which was apartheid. William Patterson was involved in the Sacco and Vanzetti case, a very important political prisoners case of the 1920s in Massachusetts. In the 1920s, he also went to Moscow to study at a higher party school. It was there that he picked up the ability to speak some Russian, although he was never as fluent as his good friend Paul Robeson became. You should also know that a turning point for William Patterson and a turning point indeed for the African American freedom struggle comes with the advent of the Scottsboro case in the early 1930s. By that time, William Patterson had returned to the United States where he became a leader of the international labor defense which in many ways was a precursor of the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression or the Civil Rights Congress, which Bill Patterson headed in the 1940s and 1950s. It was the international labor defense that took up the cause in the case of the Scottsboro Nine. You may recall that these were nine black youth in rural Alabama who were arrested on the false and malicious charge of sexual molestation of two Euro American. They were headed straight for the electric chair before the intervention of the ILD. And what happened is that the ILD was able to mobilize the international community not only to save the lives of the Scottsboro Nine, not only to force cases into the US Supreme Court, which changed the criminal law of this country, making it more difficult to exclude black people from juries, which had been the case since the end of slavery in 1865, but also the international labor defense was able to rally the international community against Jim Crow with demonstrations taking place at US embassies and consulates all over the world and helping to make Jim Crow a hated term on behalf of all progressive humanity. William Patterson also worked in the 1930s for the Communist International. You may recall that that was the organization headquartered in Moscow that sought to organize globally on behalf of socialism. And William Patterson was an operative for the Communist International in Germany at a time of rising fascism, which obviously was a very dangerous assignment since his dark skin <laughs> made it obvious that, uh, you know, that, that perhaps I should say that he was not German. In any case, he came back to the United States 
living in Chicago, became an editor of a newspaper there, participating in many struggles. But I think that perhaps the highlight of William Patterson's career comes from 1946 to 1956, or 1947, 1948 to 1956, when he is head of the Civil Rights Congress, which picks up the baton that had been formulated by the International Labor Defense, that is to say, focusing on cases of racism and political repression. It was the Civil Rights Congress, which of course coordinated the defense of the Communist Party leadership, which was placed on trial in a kangaroo court circa 1949. It was the Civil Rights Congress that focused on the case of Rosalie Ingram, a black woman who was accused of maiming, if not committing battery or murder on her landlord in a rural Georgia plantation area. These were the kinds of cases that the Civil Rights Congress focused upon, but its major effort, in my opinion, was the We Charge Genocide petition filed at the United Nations in 1950, 1951, led by Patterson and Robeson, the Civil Rights Congress charged the US authorities with genocide against black people. They published a book, We Charge Genocide, which you can still find. It's being sold in secondhand bookstores and find in many libraries. It still repays reading. It was a book that was translated into numerous languages, sold all over the world, and once again, it put Jim Crow in, in the international spotlight at a time when the United States was trying to charge the socialist camp with human rights violations the United States was put into a corner when the genocide petition flipped the script and in fact charged the United States with human rights violations, particularly against black people. This had a number of consequences. Number one, it led to Patterson being jailed. Number two, it led to Robeson's passport being taken and his income being reduced from the six figures to the four figures and of course, Paul Robeson was the great singer, actor, activist whose activism and income generating efforts helped to support the Civil Rights Congress. But perhaps more than that, the genocide petition helped to convince the US elites that the better part of wisdom would be an agonizing retreat from the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow. And thus in 1954, you saw the US Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education say that Jim Crow was no longer the law of the land, a case which, as you know, is still being resisted to a greater or lesser degree to this very day. But the US ruling class struck back in 1956 when it forced the Civil Rights Congress into liquidation. Let me conclude, because I don't think this webinar should just be my talking or lecturing by saying that in terms of the run-up to Bill Patterson passing away in 1980, that the two significant efforts that he was involved in also are worthy of mention. One is the assistance and counsel to the Black Panther Party, which had been organized in the San Francisco Bay Area, you may recall, in 1966, and second, was his organizing and counsel on behalf of the Free Angela Davis campaign, which harkened back to the Scottsboro case and harkened back to the genocide petition in terms of once again putting US racism in, in the international spotlight. Let me also say in closing that Bill Patterson was not singular, although of course this is a biography. That is to say there were a number of figures on his level. I already mentioned Paul Robeson, but I could have mentioned Claudia Jones, a black woman born in Trinidad who became a leader of the US Communist Party in New York before being deported to London, where she became a leader in London, or Shirley Graham Du Bois, who may be known to some of you as the spouse of W.E.B. Du Bois, but was a radical writer and organizer in her own right, Ben Davis, another lawyer. Harvard Law School, who was elected to New York City Council in 
1943 as a Communist Party leader, re-elected in 1945 before being ousted unceremoniously, if not illegally, in 1949 and being put on trial in that kangaroo court in New York that I referenced a few moments ago. And let me also say that this story of Bill Patterson is important not only because of his sterling qualities as an organizer, as an orator, as a writer, but also, once again, to reiterate, because the organizing of the Communist Party and the advent of the Bolshevik Revolution, both taking place approximately a century ago, were a landmark in terms of a centuries-long struggle of people of African descent in particular to escape the bonds of slavery, then Jim Crow, which obviously has an impact on the working class as a whole when it becomes less easy or more difficult to have a, an exploited segment of the working class that would help to drive down wages and working conditions for the entire working class. So Bill Patterson's life, to answer your question, is a life worth examining, is a life worth studying, and now let me turn it back to you. Well, that certainly is an excellent summary of, of why we should know about Patterson. A couple of things occur to me. First of all, you mentioned the importance of the of the party, of the Communist Party. One theme that comes through in the book is the relationship between the Communist Party and the NAACP, uh, particularly during the Scottsboro years. And by the way, I have to say that there, there are, you know, Gerald Horn, in my opinion, is not only a meticulous researcher, but it's possible for historians not to write interesting books. He writes interesting books. Listen to this. Can I just quote one, one line from the introduction? He's writing about how the NAACP leadership was having a hard time getting the attention of anybody in Washington, D.C., President Hoover, or anybody in a position of authority or influence. As the Depression was taking hold in 29, 30, and 31, the festering evils of Jim Crow were, if anything, getting worse. And here's what Gerald Horn says. Then Scottsboro hit the nation with a crushing left hook. He says, Scottsboro hit the nation and more importantly, the world with a crushing left hook. And that is in the introduction. That's on page five, I think. And when I saw that, I thought, I have to read the rest of this book. But I think you did allude to the importance of the international pressure that then came onto the, the was had to be felt by the US ruling class and leadership. And and that was because of the activity of Patterson and the party. And I believe you suggested it for a while. Some NAACP leaders and, and members paid a grudging respect to the work of the party. Am I getting that right? Yes you are. And let me say also that in history classes and colleges and history classes in high school and elementary school all over this country, and perhaps even the world, given the influence of the United States on the world, the way that the retreat of Jim Crow, this legalized system of negrophobia and hatred of black people and discrimination against black people, not only meaning sitting in the back of the bus, as Rosa Parks' example helps to illustrate, but also being subjected to lynching, that is to say, executed without due process of law, that the way the retreat of that system is taught in colleges and high schools is that all of a sudden in the 1950s, it was recognized, you know what, we're treating these black people very badly. You know, we should do something about this. And then the Supreme Court, led by this liberal, so-called Earl Warren, former governor of California, 
who, by the way, as an official of California, presided over the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, quite illegally, I might add, but somehow he becomes this great liberal in the 1950s, helping to lead the country out of the benighted atmosphere of Jim Crow. But obviously that kind of story makes no sense. What actually happened is what I'm trying to describe, not only in that book, but a number of other books, which was that with the advent of the Bolshevik Revolution, then the organizing of the Communist Party, the International Labor Defense, and then the advent of the Scottsboro case, you had Jim Crow put in the international spotlight. And then, of course, that culminates, in a sense, with the recent charge genocide petition in 1950, 1951. Now, with regard to the NAACP, there were varying relations between Patterson and the NAACP. He was very close to the NAACP lawyer, Charles Hamilton Houston, who was the mentor of Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, you may recall, becomes the chief NAACP leader after the unfortunate death of Charles Hamilton Houston, and Thurgood Marshall then becomes the first black member of the U.S. Supreme Court, appointed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. And of course, he succeeded, as you know, by Clarence Thomas, who is probably the most conservative member of the high court. But Patterson's relationship and the Communist Party's relationship with NAACP goes through various changes. I think that after Hamilton Houston dies, the relationship takes a downturn because Thurgood Marshall was willing to go along with the anti-communist consensus. But even going back to the 1930s and the Scottsboro case, there was contention and contestation between the NAACP and the Communist Party over the leadership of that case. Part of its anti-communism on the part of the NAACP leadership, anti-communism which of course causes the NAACP to purge communists and alleged communists once the Red Scare begins in the early 1950s, but part of it is also just competition. That is to say, although it may be hard for some to imagine this in 2017, but in the 1930s it was not preordained or foreordained that the NAACP would become the leading human rights organization protecting, defending the rights of black people. Uh, some people might have bet in 1932 on the International Labor Defense becoming the leading spokesperson for human rights generally. Not only human rights for black people, but human rights generally. So there was this kind of conflict, which I must say, I don't think benefited the overall movement, but in any case, there was so much pressure on the NAACP to move in that direction. They felt, I'm sure many of the leaders felt, and I know many of the leaders felt, that if they did not go in that direction, they too would be forced into liquidation, just like the Civil Rights Congress was forced into liquidation in 1956. So it's a very complicated story that I think uh, younger historians need to tell over and over again. I wonder if you would say something about what you refer to as the post-war bargain, uh, where because of the international pressure, because of the Cold War atmosphere and so on facing the U.S. ruling class, that the legal edifice of Jim Crow might begin to come down, but the leaders who had led the struggle for it would be sidelined or marginalized or worse and forgotten about. And as you argue in the book, that didn't quite happen that way in Patterson's case. But, but you also say at one point, I think we should consider the road not taken, that is whether uh, the civil rights movement or, or the country missed something by break it, by getting away from the international outlook that was that, that Patterson and, and the party was, was uh, uh, what, what they did, what they were pushing for. Was the bargain worth it? Well, I wish that question were asked more often. 
I think it's a very important question. It's a profound question, and it's not an easy question to answer. It's not an easy question to answer because, as noted, NAACP was under tremendous pressure to move in an anti-communist McCarthyite direction. And there was a fear that if they did not move in that direction, they would be forced into liquidation, as noted. But as you also suggest, what happens after the end of World War II, 1945, a war that had featured an alliance between Moscow and Washington to prevail over fascism, is that Washington quickly turned on those it had been in alliance with, that is to say, Moscow, and also many of Moscow's allies in the United States of America, including those who were communists or presumed to be communists, or those who were simply left-leaning, for example. And so what happens with regard to the Black Freedom Movement, it reminds me of what happens in Central America in the 1970s and the 1980s. That is to say, you might recall that the U.S. policy towards, say, Guatemala was called uh, frijoles y fusiles, uh, beans and rifles. <laughs> in other words, with regard to black people, on the one hand, there was this grudging concession of anti-Jim Crow measures led by Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and then a Civil Rights Act in 1957 under Eisenhower, another Civil Rights Act in 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965. Those were the beans. But then the rifles, of course, was the tremendous repression, the jailing of Patterson, the harassment of Robeson, and perhaps more significantly, the squashing of left-wing unions, such as the union led by Ferdinand Smith, the Jamaican, who was the number two in command of the National Maritime Union, at one, at one time one of the more powerful forces in the trade union movement, and on the left, the repression of the West Coast longshoremen under Harry Bridges, born in Australia, an effort to deport him occupied a considerable attention, considerable attention of the U.S. ruling class. And as I've argued recently, I don't think you can begin to understand this Trump phenomenon without understanding what happened to the U.S. working class as a result of the repression of left-led trade unions, which had been leading the way in terms of improving the wages and working conditions of working class people and also uplifting them ide ideologically. But with the repression of those unions, it leaves a certain segment of the working class somewhat defenseless ideologically, making them more susceptible to the kind of demagogic appeals as represented by the current occupant of the Oval Office. So this whole phenomenon that I'm discussing a historic epic lasting from 1917 to 2017 with certain peaks, such as in the 1930s with Scottsboro and certain valleys represented in the 1950s by the Red Scare and McCarthyism leading to the retreat of certain union forces. I don't think you can begin to understand what's happening today without understanding what's happened over the past century. Let's see. Let's see if Tony has a question. Tony Pesanowski, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Horn, always a pleasure, and uh, looking forward to any forthcoming books you might be uh, working on. Um, one question that I had, and it's kind of in two parts, is uh, um, often missing from most analysis of the Communist Party's history is its ongoing leadership work in the 1960s and 70s era uh, black liberation struggles. Um, as you write uh, and, and noted earlier, Patterson uh, provided legal counsel to the uh, Black Panther Party, and I'm curious if it's possible to, one, explore that in a little bit more detail, and also we uh, reflect on whether or not Patterson's relationship to the Black Panthers created any tensions between him 
and other party leaders within the Communist Party. Yeah. Well, with regard to the latter, <clears throat> there was there were uh, there was not no uni unanimity of opinion uh, within the higher levels of the Communist Party with regard to the Black Panther Party, and I think that. The Black Panther Party is a complicated case because, as I suggest in the book, what happens at a certain point is that the leadership of the Black Panther Party stops accepting the counsel, if you like, of Bill Patterson and starts down the pathway of a certain kind of ultra-leftism, and it becomes ensnared and something that those who have as much gray hair as myself might recall, that is to say the conflict between then Maoist China and the international communist movement and the leadership of the Black Panther Party was swayed by Maoism. In fact, they sent many high-level delegations to, uh, to uh, the city then known as Peking. And in the minds of certain party leaders, this tended to vindicate and validate their earlier apprehension about the Black Panther Party, although, of course, we can quarrel, if not quibble, about that kind of analysis. With regard to the Black Liberation Movement generally, I'm in the midst of uh, going to write a very long book on U.S. imperialism, anti-communism, and the struggle to liberate Southern Africa. And part of the story, of course, is the story of the anti-apartheid movement in this country. And part of the story will be about how the now celebrated African National Congress of South Africa, which is still in alliance with the South African Communist Party, had a kind of uphill climb gaining adherence in the 1970s and 1980s, including from some today who you would think were in strict solidarity with Mandela. But that's mostly a post-1994 phenomenon, that is to say after the democratic elections in South Africa. And strikingly enough, you had communists, particularly in an organization that came into being in 1973 with the rather tongue-twisting name of the National Anti-Imperialist Movement in Solidarity with African Liberation. I'm sure you can imagine that that name came out of long nights of deliberation, trying to touch every base. <laughs> but in any case, Namesel, as it came to be known, played a very pivotal role in terms of rallying support for the ANC when it was being red baited tremendously. And I would argue that that support for the ANC and also the support for the MPLA in Angola, which was similarly oriented politically and for other forces in the region, such as for Limo and Mozambique, helped to push many young black Americans, including myself, to the left. And that is a story that needs to be told in more detail. Tony? Okay, let's see if we can open it up to the audience. Are we? Um, so if you have any questions, please use your raised hand icon. Click your raised hand icon, and we will scroll through and open your mic. Please use your raised hand icon if you have any questions. Ken, now unmute yourself. Ken Heard, now, okay, your mic is open. Uh, greetings, comrades, sisters, and brothers. Um, Mr. Horn, Dr. Horn, uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight, and I think that you've just given us a real overview of what we need to know about around our own party. One of the first things I'd like to ask, and I'm going to be short with this, the Civil Rights Congress, you had said, went out of existence, was forced out of existence in 1956. 
you have a book that is enormous. I haven't been able to get a copy of it, but I am going to do so on the Civil Rights Congress. I need to know basically what happened to actually overthrow the Civil Rights Congress from the perch that it was operating in as long as it had been going through things. And we had heard that it had been deteriorating in 1949. Some people have a rumor out that it was not in existence by 1950. And you had mentioned other red operating leagues that were in the struggle during that period. Could you embroil upon that, please? Well, the Civil Rights Congress, the CRC from this point, was a logical successor to the International Labor Defense. It's organized at a convention in Detroit in 1946, and it has very strong chapters, and this is something we're focusing on, focusing on. Its strongest chapters were in, in New York, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles. But it also had very strong support in the Deep South. I talk in that book at length about the case of Willie McGee, who was a black man who was headed to the electric chair because of an allegation about rape of a Euro-American woman. And in fact, he, that too became an international case. Uh, there were rallies all over the world just before he was executed in the early 1950s. Interestingly enough, he was executed outdoors. It was like an outdoors lynching. They had uh, somehow hooked up an electric chair and had masses of you know, races in the crowd as he was fried. Bella Abzug, who you may recall, became a leading liberal member of the U.S. Congress and a leading feminist icon in the 1960s and 1970s, was his lawyer. She worked very closely with the Civil Rights Congress, and that's part of the theme of that book, which is how, once again, you can't begin to understand the upsurge in Mississippi, for example, in the 1960s without understanding the organizing of the 1950s, nor can you understand, in a certain sense, why so many of the Jim Crow advocates were always saying that the Civil Rights Movement was communist-dominated or communist-influenced without understanding their past and previous experience with the Civil Rights Congress, setting their demagogy and red baiting aside for a moment. Now, I don't think it's fair to suggest, and I'm sure, of course you were not doing so, that the Civil Rights Congress was on its last legs in 1949 and 1950. What happened, of course, was repression. Uh, Patterson was jailed. There were numerous investigations, not only federal investigations, but state investigations, particularly in New York State. New York, as I said, was where their strongest chapter was. And as I, the metaphor that I use in the book was that the Civil Rights Congress had become firefighters who spent most of their time putting out fires at the firehouse. <laughs> that is to say, it seemed like they were only in existence to defend themselves which of course was a legitimate ambition on the one hand, but on the other hand, there had to be some concern as to whether or not that was an adequate deployment of resources, particularly when in 1955, you would have the onset of the Montgomery bus boycott, you'd have the Emmett Till case. It seemed like a new kind of movement was developing. And so that repression and a certain kind of calculation on the part of the leadership forced the Civil Rights Congress into liquidation. Uh, that book, I'm afraid to say, is rather hard to find, although you can find it in libraries. Okay, Norma, your mic is open. Norma Harrison, your mic is open. Hi, everybody. Uh, ben, you said something about the revelatory effect of uh, reading Gerald's book about Bill Patterson. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. As a history teacher, retired now, I knew the name of William Patterson. I knew something about his life. I knew 
something about the Scottsboro case. I had heard, for example, of the petition to the UN, but what I did not know, or what I did not really grasp, was the texture of Patterson's life, where he came from, how he grew into a uh, such an activist and a personality, and uh, such a dominant force, really. And as as Dr. Horn points out, he wasn't the only one. But for example, that Patterson joined the Communist Party after his experience going to Boston with other with other uh, demonstrators and trying to save the lives of Sacco and Vanzetti. And he said, uh, Dr. Horn mentioned in his book that, that uh, Patterson said it was the failure to save their lives that changed his life and, and brought him into the Communist Party where he stayed for the rest of his life. Uh, uh, one more thing, his, his experience when he went to Moscow in the, in the late 20s and so on. Um, and by the way, where uh, he had, uh, he married a Russian Jewish woman, had two Soviet daughters, uh, and and engaged in some rough and tumble debates and so on, in uh, while he was there, and I get the impression that it his experience there sort of steeled him and gave him a vision of what the international struggle was and was that was coming to be, that maybe he he wouldn't have had otherwise. And maybe, uh, I wonder if the more centrist leaders of the NAACP didn't have that outlook that he had. So those are just a couple of things that, that uh, I really I got from reading this book. And so uh, I'll stop there, but maybe other people have questions for Dr. Horn. Or maybe he has a response. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Albert, yes. your mic is open. Albert, your mic is open. Okay, thank you. The question after reading about uh, William Patterson's life and how he was prevented from going to the UN and going through the full process uh, of charging the genocide uh, has always plagued me. And, I, and it ties into, I guess, what I see as the ups and downs of our economy so that every 30 years we seem to go back through this Jim Crow and we're back into this new Jim Crow now in my estimation. And so there's a two-part question. Why didn't we continue with that we charge genocide to its complete? And what have we learned from that that we should take with us now because it looks like this Jim Crow is coming back around for a while again? Well, I think one of the lessons we should learn is this. Uh, future historians, assuming that the present occupant of the White House does not blow up the planet, will no doubt conclude that the retreat of socialism beginning circa 1989 had a damaging impact, a devastating impact on the struggle for equality here in the United States of America. A future historian may very well conclude that spiraling rates of incarceration in particular can be correlated with the lessening of international pressure on the United States and the US ruling class in particular. I think that that's one of the lessons that we should draw. Now with regard to the genocide petition, you may also know that there have been efforts to duplicate that kind of uh, that kind of initiative. That is to say, in the 1970s, this is the National Conference of Black Lawyers, an organization I had an affiliation with, tried to walk in the footsteps of Patterson and Robeson by filing a similar petition. Uh, you may also know that today, with regard to the Black Lawyers, that they have a particular international initiative 
that Gerald, I think, say, uh, I think your computer. They were involved with that use about a year or so ago. I think your computer is has is uh, freezing or. Okay, that, it was a phone call. I, I'm using a a, a a phone as a hotspot. Is it back on now? Yes. Okay, so the Black Lives Matter movement was involved with this United Nations team that came to a number of U.S. City, US United States cities about a year or so ago and came back with a stinging report suggesting that black people are owed reparations and detailing a horrendous pattern of racialism and racism that I'm sure this audience is quite familiar with. So there have been efforts to try to duplicate and replicate what the Civil Rights Congress did in the early 1950s a problem is that the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a significant movement, but it does not have the international network that Patterson had access to, not only given his own personal experience in Moscow and in Germany, meeting revolutionaries from all over the world, but also having this international network of communist parties with bases all over the world. And I think that one of the lessons we should draw from this history is the dire necessity to accelerate to the extent that we can the kind of internationalism that led to our past and previous victories. Andrew, your mic is open. Andrew. Thank you. Dr. Horn, I was wondering if you could just briefly detail and explain the nature of the relationship in the creation of the common turn in terms of how much of the weight was defined by geopolitics in regards to the newly formed Soviet Union and how much of it was related to colonial liberation and particularly the uh, struggle against Jim Crow. Well, I assume what you mean by geopolitics is the objective and goal of defending socialism in the Soviet Union. And I would say that that was certainly an objective because, as I was indicating just a moment or two ago, once you had the retreat of the socialist camp beginning in 1989, that not only was a blow to people who lived within the borders of the socialist camp. It was a blow to people who did not <laughs> reside within the socialist camp. Point number two is that my own opinion is, and this, this somewhat goes against the grain of what other writers have suggested, was that the United States needed some kind of intervention, just like some people need an intervention. <laughs> and, the intervention in this case came from the Communist International in the sense that they were meeting with U.S. leaders in Moscow with regard to trying to work out some sort of uh, theoretical position on what used to be called the Negro National question. And of course, uh, you may know that that led to the so-called Negro Nation thesis, which I won't go into any detail at the moment. But you may also know that there was a similar process unfolding. Not The Communist International wasn't just a, a bilateral organization operating between the USSR and the US. It was a global organization. So they were working out similar sorts of positions, say, with regard to South Africa at the time. In one book that I wrote, I can't recall which one, I talk about how the working out of the national question of South Africa inevitably impacted how many in the Communist International view the national question in the United States of America. But in any case, setting aside the theoretical determinants of this Negro national question or the question of the native republic in South Africa, the issue always was, on a day-to-day -day basis, relentless struggle, such as the Scottsboro case, and internationalizing the struggle be it Jim Crow or apartheid. 
Dr. Horn? Yes. Oh, hi. It, it's an honor to ask you a question. I have many questions, but I know time is limited, so I'm going to have one question that you kind of touched on, but I'd like you to touch on a little bit more. I want to play um, It's a Wonderful Life, and I'm referring to the movie from, I think, the early 1940s, where Jimmy Stewart's character gets to see his life as if he had not existed. What would the civil rights movement, if it would have existed, what would it be, what would these things look like had it not been for men like Patterson, women like Claudia Jones, and Dorothy Healy, and the Communist Party? What would this country look like, in your opinion, and do you think it's fair to say the United States would have been itself a fascist power? <laughs> well, I once wrote um, a few years ago that we in the United States are engaged in a very dangerous experiment right now. <laughs> the dangerous experiment is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the rapacious ruling class which has shown no compunction about moving all the way to the right as their policies in Afghanistan have shown over the last three to four decades up to and including going to bed with those who they now term fascists. And we have been going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this rapacious ruling class at the same time that many of our unions were forced or perhaps were not forced to purge their leadership of radicals and progressives when many of our people's organizations, such as the NAACP, were forced to do the same. Given that context of what's happened in the United States over the past half century, perhaps you should not see it as coincidental that we're now faced with this catastrophe masquerading as a precedent. Now, the question you ask is obviously counterfactual. As the, might be said in court, you're asking the witness to give an opinion, and this witness has no hesitation to give an opinion, which is that I think that but for the existence of the Communist Party and those within its orbit, the leaders you mentioned, Claudia Jones, John Howard Lawson, Ferdinand Smith, Ben Davis, Shirley Graham, etc., that I shudder to think where this country would be at this point. And I think that right now we're getting a foretaste of what's in store when you have a neo-fascist in the White House. Gerald, your your screen has become extremely uh, dark. It's like the light has uh, we've lost the light. Anthony, your mic is open. Anthony, your mic is open. Um, is that me? Go on, Anthony. I thought I had unmuted myself, but I'll ask the question anyway. If let's close your eyes a minute, pretend that technology did not allow the invent of TV, radio, things that made worldwide communication possible. I'm of the opinion that we'd still be in the Jim Crow era in 2017. What I'm trying to say is the international pressure is what led the government to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on and on and then enforce it with federal troops and stuff. Do uh, either one of you agree, Dr. Hall, Dr. Horn? or Mr. Sears, that the international pressure is really what led us to escape the cruelness of Jim Crow society, or could it have happened without the technology bringing international countries aware of our problems in America? Well, you're asking a number of questions. Let me focus on the international. I mean, I focus a lot on the international question because I, I think it doesn't get enough focus and emphasis in the mainstream and in college classrooms and high school classrooms, et cetera. And some of my sterner critics might suggest that I've gone overboard. But I'm trying to bring more balance to the discussion. But in bringing balance to the discussion, 
I would not want to suggest in any way at all that the tireless dedication and organizing of people in the trenches in Jim Crow Mississippi, Jim Crow Texas, Jim Crow Georgia was a cipher or was unimportant. I think that it took two wings for this anti-Jim Crow bird to fly. And what I'm trying to suggest is that oftentimes in our classrooms, they only talk about one wing and they ignore the international pressure, in which today helps to explain why some are talking about a new Jim Crow with this new era of mass incarceration, for example. Now, with regard to the international technology, one of the things I've commented on is that I find it rather curious, and I think that future historians may find it curious also, that despite the fact that supersonic transport allows you to fly from New York to Cape Town within the course of one day and uh, contact someone instantaneously through Skype or email anywhere on planet Earth, and yet the internationalism, at least as far as many of our organizations, is at an all-time low. I mean, that's a kind of anomaly that needs to be explained. And I think part of the explanation is that the U.S. ruling class watches internationalism like a hawk. It's no accident that many of our leaders ran afoul of the authorities once they began to speak about issues outside the boundaries of the United States. Martin Luther King, of course, makes his anti-war speech in April 1967. He's killed by April 1968. Uh, I've talked about the example of Paul Robeson and the genocide petition. And so I think that it is appropriate for you to raise that question because I think that's where we need more emphasis as we speak. Michael, your mic is open. Michael Simonian, your mic is open. Speak up, Michael. We can't hear you. I'm closing your mic. Michael, your mic is open. Okay, it seems that we can't. Uh, and then there's one more question. Toussaint, your mic is open. Toussaint. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, Professor Horn. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the folks who organized uh, the webinar. I actually had the opportunity to teach an African American history class this afternoon and talked a little bit about the Rosalie Ingram case in the context of the Civil Rights Congress, Civil Rights Congress and its kind of competition with the NAACP. So this is really a great refresher and kind of wish I had uh, got a chance to listen to this before teaching it. But um, nonetheless, uh, my question is pretty simple. Um, uh, curious as to how you went about uh, researching and writing this book and if you have um, a subsequent project that you are uh, currently working on. Oh man, I'm working on a number of projects. I don't know if you want to hear about all of them. <laughs> but w with regard to the Patterson uh, book, his papers were located at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And then, of course, I did research in other archives as well. But that was the major source, his papers at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, unless pressed, I'll skip over, I'm working on about six different books right now. So unless pressed, I'll skip over those and go to the next question. Actually, we're running out of time. And uh, let me see, Mike. Um, If we're out of time, can I say something? Just a minute. Yeah, that. Yeah, if Just Michael, a minute. Just a minute, Mike. Your uh, Michael Simonian, your mic is open. Okay. He he's we he's we can't reach him. Uh, so go on. I'm sorry. Well, on the last question about the research, Dr. Horn mentioned the the. Patterson papers at Howard University and so on. But 
if you look at the if you look at his footnotes, he went to plenty of other places as well, and his his research was was wide, and uh, that's part of why the book is so important. I think the sources that he he uh, consulted, and uh, that's that's a very impressive piece of work. In fact. I understand. Yeah, he's he's written so many books. I don't know how he does it all, but uh, doing the research, is, doing the meticulous research, is part of being a historian. The other part is writing engaging books, and he does both of those things. And I think we're very fortunate to have him with us tonight to spend his time on this uh, special book. And um, I'm going to read some more. I have read a couple of his other ones, and I going to keep uh, to keep myself uh, keep at it. And I want to thank him for his for his time and his his, uh, his input tonight. Well, let's see if anybody else has a question. Uh, turning to the panelists, you don't have a raised hand icon, uh, so if you have a question, speak up, Tony. I opened your mic. The we're in the final moments. Uh, so anybody who has a question, please speak up. Tony, you have a final question? Well, I, I, I for one, would actually be very interested in hearing about uh, Dr. Horn's uh, uh, up, upcoming and other projects that he's working on. Uh, I don't know if we want to spend that time doing it now, but I would definitely be interested. Go on, Gerald. You have the floor. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> okay. So I have about four books coming out in the next year. One uh, is on the black press. Another is on black people in aviation. Black people used to be very much into aviation. They actually started the Ethiopian Air Force during the Italian invasion of the 1930s, and now Ethiopian Airways is the most significant carrier on the African continent, which is knitting together the entire continent. That's directly a result a black American initiative. I have another book coming out on 17th century slavery. It's really the origins of settler colonialism in North America and in, in the Caribbean. And the subtitle is The Roots of White Supremacy, Slavery, and Capitalism, which I'm tracing back to the uh, 17th century in uh, North America and the Caribbean. And let's see, what's the fourth? Oh, yeah, a, a book on uh, Afro-Asian solidarity. That'll be out uh, sometime in the next year or so. And then I'm working on a book on jazz history, the political economy of jazz, the music, and a book on the South Africa, you know, the U.S. Southern Africa struggle. And after I finish, I hope to finish those next year, and then I'm going to start a book on radicalism in Washington, D.C. Because, you know, if you're serious about uh, trying to take power, you have to at some point look at what's, what happened in terms of people trying to take power in Washington, D.C. over the decades. And I've also planned to do a book, do a book on uh, organized crime and boxing and, on, and a short biography of Claudia Jones. Okay. Um, well, we're a little past the hour, uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for participating tonight. Uh, tolerating the missteps and technological problems and whatnot. We look forward to having Gerald again in the future. He, uh, in addition to books, he, he writes forwards to books. So he wrote a forward uh, to um, um, uh, a book on the Russian Revolution written by uh, Henry, written by Philip Fawner. If I'm, am, am I correct? Philip Answered by Philip Foner. It was reactions in the United States to the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, reactions in 1917, 1918. So when that book is reissued, we hope to have Gerald back. So on behalf of uh, Ben and and everyone who worked to help pull this together, I thank you and I express uh, our deepest appreciation to Dr. Gerald Horn and bid everyone good night. Thank, good night. You. Thank you. Thank you.